Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. This is a great, great Thursday morning. And we have Kathy Stats on the line with us. Good morning, Kathy. Good morning. How are you this morning? Well, I'm pretty well, recovering from a cold, so I'm a little bit hoarse, but hopefully my voice will hold out today. Well, it sounds great right now. So good. Let's go. Great. Let's play. All right. Are you the educational director of the Wisconsin Farmers Union? What's the right. Wisconsin Farmers Union first? So Wisconsin Farmers Union is what's considered one of the general farm organizations, which means that we focus on, you know, um, general farm issues, no particular commodity. Um, and as an advocacy organization, we were organized back in 1902 in Texas, actually, by farmers who were interested in bettering their um, life through advocacy and through cooperatives. And advocacy is going to the politicians and trying to get policies made that helps farmers? Right. So Wisconsin Farmers Union and uh, Farmers Union as a national organization uh, frequently uses a triangle to explain um, kind of the major tenets of the organization's work. And so that equilateral triangle features legislation or civic advocacy on one side, cooperation on the other, And education at the base, indicating that unless you teach folks how to be civically engaged, unless you teach folks how to use the cooperative business model, um, you know, you can't better your life through this collaborative action. So we're right now talking about the fifth principle of cooperation, this training, education, information, getting it out to the public. Absolutely. Okay. I like it. So the Farmers um, Union, 1902 in Texas. So is there a farmer's union in each state, and then it makes up a national organization? So the farmer's union is a grassroots organization, so the state level of organization depends on the engagement in that state. So um, there are farmer's union members in every state in the nation. Uh, Not every state has an organized state chapter, so anybody who's a member in one of those states that isn't organized would just be an at-large member through the National Farmers Union Organization, which as a federated structure is made up of all of those uh, farmers union um, member states. Okay. All right. So here's this national group. You have all of these different organizations at different states, and you have somebody from every state that belongs to the national. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's big. (laughs) It is big. (laughs) And it has a great history. 1902 in Texas. So you have a sense of how many farmers Mm -hmm. are throughout all of these organizations that represent that the National Association represents? We typically would say at about 200,000 member families, and that's sort of an interesting aspect of the organization, um, that it's not just an individual person who is a member, but it's actually a family membership. And that grew out of our appreciation and understanding of family farm agriculture really being, you know, all hands on deck. So one of the things that's sort of distinctive about our organization is that from the earliest days, There was a sort of a named primary member on the membership, but the spouse of that person and any children aged 16 to 21 were actually full voting rights privileged members within the organization. So there's actually many more members than the number shows because each, um, you know, each membership represents that whole family and sort of recognizes you know, the involvement and the voice of the whole family, including those young adults who, um, you know, back then as now are taking a pretty significant role in the work and decision making on those family farms. And what was that age range for those children? 16 to 21 was the voting age for children within the family. 
right? So um, everybody's a member per se. Um, everybody's counted um, in terms of participation in our education programs, our camp programs. But actually, once you turn 16, once you turn 16 in the organization, you can serve as a delegate to the state, to the national convention, and have a full voice in the organization's work. And what happens after 21? You have to get your own membership? Yeah, that's the expectation. We recognize that, you know, through that age, um, some folks may still be, you know, getting started in college, et cetera, um, or maybe doing a vocational program. Um, but we would expect that starting at age 21, that they um, become members, um, you know, with their own membership. Wow. I know nothing about this. I've never been on a <laughs> farm or I've been on a farm, but not in this farm yeah. and family farming thing. We did about uh, what I think would have probably been about an acre when I was growing up. Well, my two brothers and dad, we would uh, maybe about six to ten years, we would, uh, one of our neighbors would allow us to plant. Uh, the only part of farming that I like, uh, Kathy, was the harvesting part. Well, really was the eating mm. part of the harvest after that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the part I like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So how did you get involved with Wisconsin Farmers Union? Well, I grew up in it, actually. Um, I'm a product of the youth and camp program. My parents were invited to join probably in the, as I recall, the late uh, 70s, early 80s. Um, I grew up on a small dairy farm in the southern part of the state of Wisconsin, just a, about a half an hour from our state capital of Madison. And so uh, when I was six, seven years old, I started attending what are called our day classes or our day camps, which were typically hosted by a farm family in the local community, maybe at a local park, maybe on a farm. And when I was nine, I attended our overnight camp program for the first time. And that really launched a lifelong connection to the organization, which continues today in my present work. So first grader, you go to a day camp, <laughs> okay, six years mm-hmm. old. So you have regular school, and then in the summer you have some kind of day camp or something that you go to at somebody's farm. So these these were typically just one day programs um, periodically throughout the year. So starting in kindergarten, first grade, farmers union youth can attend to these activities. They're a little bit like 4-H. I tell folks who maybe have a background with 4-H um, mm-hmm. in the sense that they're typically run by local volunteers. They have often some kind of structure at the county level, but at the county level, it's still all volunteers. And so um, it's not necessarily an every month kind of game gathering, but it might be, you know, one or two events during the summer, maybe something um, in the fall, a get together, perhaps something around the holiday break when schools are off. Um, Some youth groups meet more regularly, some meet maybe just three or four times a year. So it wouldn't have been a regular everyday kind of program, but um, just an opportunity to connect from time to time to do some activities, to maybe um, play some games, maybe tour a local co-op, maybe have a guest speaker, maybe volunteer for uh, the county farmers union's summer picnic or something along those lines. Wow. Okay. All right. So at nine, you go to the night, the overnight camp, and is that right. where Camp Kenwood comes in? Yes, so that's the name of Wisconsin Farmers Union's camp facility. Um, Camp Kenwood was named after Ken Hones, who was the president at the time that this notion of um, having our own camp facility was born. Farmers Union had started holding summer camps in the 1930s, actually. The first camps were in Montana and North Dakota. And in Wisconsin, we started um, in sort of the late 30s using rented facilities, But in the mid-40s, it became the dream of our current president at that time to have a place we could call our own. And so the camp was built with mostly volunteer labor. Um, Local farmers, you know, came and helped clear brush and put up the buildings. And uh, so I started attending those camps um, when I was nine. A lot of kids um, came knowing it was kind of their only vacation, their only break from the work of of the farm in the summer. But there were also town kids, city kids who came along as well. Uh, And so it was a great opportunity for kids from all kinds of backgrounds to come together for just a few days, you know, four or five days. Uh, We couldn't really get away from the farm for any longer than that. There's a lot to be done in the summer. But it was a chance to get away, you know, uh, to build some independence, to build some leadership skills, and, you know, to learn about the issues important to family farms and rural communities and cooperatives. 
and cooperative. Well, I'm glad we got that word in since the program is called Everything mm-hmm. Co-op. <laughs> like to talk about cooperative. <laughs> it's pretty important uh, to us, yeah. Actually, the, I didn't mention this earlier. The full name of the organization is actually the Farmers Educational and Cooperative Union of America. Uh, and we shortened that to Farmers Union years ago, but our legal name still has that education and cooperative component to it. Farmers Educational and Cooperative Mm-hmm. Uh, Union of America. Wow. Yeah, that is a mouthful. <laughs> you understand why we use Farmers Union for short. Yes. Farmers Educational and Cooperative Union of America. And when was this right, started? And for the other, mm-hmm. Was that the 1902? They started with that name? Uh, yeah, that's right. That's the earliest uh, version of the of the organization's name. I mean, there were a number of other farm organizations around that time um, that some of them came together to form what is now the Farmers Educational Cooperative Union of America. Um, this is part of a long sort of history of, you know, progressive um, work for farmers to come together and better their situation, better their communities. Um, one of the things that I often m- want to point out, though, is that we're while we have an affinity with labor unions, we're not considered a labor union. We're really um, a service or- association. And Wisconsin's organization, in fact, happens to be incorporated under Wisconsin's cooperative statute. So we're considered a sort of an education and service cooperative. Great. I'm just back on this name, Farmers Educational and Cooperative Union of America. I love it. Okay, 1902. So two years ago, which would have been 2017, the uh, um, NCBA CLUSA celebrated 100 years. So that means that they were probably around 1917, 1915 or something when they got started. Uh, Mm -hmm. You guys were 1902. Okay. Because I knew nothing about co-ops, Kathy, until I started managing housing co-ops. And then I followed Mm. in love with this model of what it does for people. So just I just keep learning. This program has been on the air now six years. And we were only going to do it one month, the month of October, six years ago. And it's just really taken on. And I love it because I keep learning. And uh, just like this history you were telling me about. We're going to take our first break, and I'd like to come back and get more into, uh, well, I've taught 12 years of my career, so I'm very much into education and how you can start early on with somebody six years old or pre-kindergarten learning about cooperation and what are some of the kinds of things that you have learned and you all make sure that people keep continue to learn while you are hiking and fishing and swimming and playing co-op games. <laughs> <laughs> what are the kinds of tools that you're trying to get people to know? So we're going to take our first Absolutely. break and we'll be right back. Information is power. Yep, that's why co- um, WL makes a great partner for this program because as we were just talking with Kathy uh, Stats, that the Farmers Educational and Cooperative Union of America, their foundation, their fundamentally is education. Education is giving out information, getting people to understand different kinds of lessons so that they can live a quality life. So that's what we want to get into next. Um, I know that the... Farmers Union, or this Farmers Educational Cooperative Union, was started in 1902 in Texas, and it's now it's a nationwide group, and with education as the foundation, cooperative and legislation are the other two prongs of this organization. And so when she was growing up, she started in pre-kindergarten or kindergarten in the first grade, and then she went to day camp when she got to be nine years old and stayed overnight, or overnight camp. Uh, so... Kathy, what are some of the kinds of things that you all learn? Oh, no, let's start first with what are, what are some of the kinds of things that you do in this overnight camp and what are the things that you're trying to teach people or in your case, what you were learning in the beginning? Sure. So we are considered both an educational and recreational camp. And so that means many of the things you associate with summer camp are there, right? So uh, we're situated on a beautiful lake, so we can go swimming. We are um, adjoining a state park, which incidentally, a part of that property was originally part of our camp facility. When the state park was established, a portion of that property became part of the state park. So we have a gate into the state park trail system, so we can do a a morning um, hike through the woods, which is beautiful. 
we have campfires with s'mores and, you know, uh, skips with silly songs and costumes. We have casual sports. We have a lot of those things that folks associate with a summer camp experience. You know, lit, staying in a cabin, um, you know, uh, nights um, out under the stars, you know, at a campfire. One of the things that's distinctive is this cooperative education component. So we have um, sort of three lesson or workshop times during the day. One is always focused on an issue related to the work of Farmers Union, often related to land or water or food issues. One topic is always related to um, you know, sort of global issues or personal development. So, for example, that the, those lessons have included everything over the years from uh, <clears throat> renewable energy to uh, uh, fair trade to uh, personal development issues around cyberbullying or, uh, you know, um, understanding how the Olympics work from a global perspective. I mean, lots of different topics that get, get kids thinking both internally and externally about their world. But there's always, and this is something that goes back to the earliest days of our camp program, always a lesson on co-ops. And in Wisconsin, we use a, sort of a three-year rotation of um, programming because we recognize that a lot of kids come to camp maybe as early as eight, continue all the way through 18. So there cannot be a static curriculum, right? Because the same kid might come year after year after year. So how do we give them some cooperative basics, um, but in a new and fresh and interesting and fun way every year? So one year we might focus on the structure of co-ops, that is to say, um, you know, that co-ops are there for their members, the members elect a board, the board hires a manager, the manager hires the employees, and the employees are there to serve the members. So kind of demonstrating that circular structure of cooperatives, which is a little bit different from the hierarchy of kind of traditional business. Kathy, wait a minute. Um, I'm going to stop, you. Mm-hmm. stop you one second. You said it so sure. clearly. I got that however old you are now, you've been dealing with it for a long time. <laughs> you said it so <laughs> clear. I mean, I, I understand the structure and I, I have that chart and I, and I will also teach from that structure, but I've never mm-hmm. heard it so succinctly put in such a short time. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you're, you're welcome. I mean, the, the, the basic notion here is that, as I often say, you know, think about the average age of a kid running a lemonade stand. They're not an MBA student, right? They're fairly young kids. And so a lot of these basic concepts can be introduced at a pretty early age and kids can get it, you know? So whether it's the structure, whether it's the sort of types and sectors, which is something we talked about this past summer. So that is to say, um, we used a kind of a, a notion of thinking about both the power and the purpose of cooperatives. So the power element was who owns it, right? For what, um, for what power uh, um, empowerment is there? Is it for the consumer to save money? Is it for the producer to earn more? Is it for the employee to control more? Is it for small business to be able to do more, right? So what, who has the power in that cooperative? And then what is the purpose? What is the sector it occupies? So is it consumers gathering together to um purchase groceries. So is it the sort of the grocery and food sector? Is it uh, farmers seeking to market a product through the agricultural sector? Is it everyday working people coming together to gain greater power in the financial sector through a credit union or to access electricity through a rural electric? So we looked at both of those Um, uh, elements, if you will, of cooperatives, both who holds the power and then for what purpose do those folks empower themselves to get something they couldn't get on their own. So that was this past year's topic. And um, and then another. Okay, so I got that, Kathy, before you go to the next one, I got that as power and purpose, P and P, the Mm -hmm. P square. What what does this look like? Who has the power? Now, I'm going to, I'm not wanting you to repeat that, but I'm going to go back and listen to this power, this three things that you talked about for power, mm-hmm. or maybe with four, in, in terms of who are the, the stakeholders, if you will. Right, and what's, their, right. what's their reason and what are they trying to do and purpose? Okay, got it. That's beautiful. Keep going. Yeah. What's the other? Sure. And so the final le- le- lesson then is, um, or the third uh, topic, rather, I should say, is is around cooperatives in the international space. So Farmers Union, from its earliest days, was very interested not just in raising 
the quality of life for farmers here, but being um, in solidarity with farmers and rural people around the world. So Farmers Union um, and its educational program have always had a nod to global awareness in our programming. Um, lots of folks know, for example, the term care package, right? Uh, that's something you might send to your kid in college, you know, a package of cookies or some warm socks over a cold day. Not everyone knows the origin of CARE, which was um, an acronym uh, for the Cooperative for American Remittances to Europe. NCBA CLUSA International was a huge part of the, the origin of CARE, but National Farmers Union was there as well, one of the organizing groups to bring um, food to the starving people of Europe in the aftermath of World War II. And so as an organization, you know, even in those early days, we were looking at how we could help people around the world, how we could help rebuild agriculture, how we could help um, folks um, to find um, access to markets in a way that dis did not you know, disadvantage other farmers around the world. And so that international component is really important to us. Back in the 1950s, when I look in the old National Camp um, yearbooks, I see that they had guests from India and China, and I'm thinking it can't have been easy to travel in those days, and yet it was important to us as an organization to engage with our, you know, our fellow farmers around the world and bring some of that knowledge and awareness to kids even in the most rural parts of America. And can you tell me what that care stood, stood for? Cooperative? I got cooperative sure. in Europe. Okay. Yeah, the Cooperative for American Remittances to Europe. Okay. So the name changed over the years as their mission and their work changed, um, as they grew, you know, beyond just the boundaries of Europe, as um, as they became a nonprofit rather than strictly a, a, a cooperative. You know, CARE still exists as an NGO doing work in developing nations around the world, um, but its origin story was uh, a very basic uh, need to help feed hungry people, and it was, you know, a collaborative effort of cooperatives, of farm organizations, of the faith and labor community. It's a great story, a great history that a lot of folks don't know. And no. you really want to make sure that young people understand, you know, if they're in college someday and they get a care package, they remember that, hey, there's actually a cooperative um, story behind this contemporary idea. That's fascinating. I did not. That, that's why I love this program so much. I keep learning. And the story you just sitting here telling me about World War Two and the afterwards and the role that co-ops played and farmers played in helping to feed Europeans. God, wonderful. Mm -hmm. OK. And I, I didn't get a lot of care packages in college. I needed them, but I didn't get a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> nice. OK. Do you like what you do? Do I like what I do? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the best job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I love the aspect of the camp program, um, especially. That's really what drew me to this position with Farmers Union. Of course, I do a number of other things. I um, work with our, you know, um, our overall organization's education work. Uh, I help co-coordinate the college conference on cooperatives with the National Farmers Union and uh, other things, but the um, you know the the really the initial connection for me was that camp program. It was coming to camp every summer, um, getting a chance to get off the farm for a few days and meet friends from around the country, and you know really um, learn about the larger world. I mean, one of the really fun parts of camp, in addition to the co-op lessons, is the co-op store. And this is something, too, that's been a part of all of our camps going way back to the 1930s that, uh, before you know, a lot you, of Before you go there, like I, want, I want to know about yeah. this co-op store, but I just want to get, yeah. I really want to get your answer to, do you like what you do? You started there by saying the things that you're doing. And so the camp program is one of the things, the college conferences, and what else? And I really, I reason that was right there for me to ask because I get that you love what you do. I, I get that you don't wake <laughs> up going, oh, I hate going to work today. I don't think you have that in your space at all. Okay. It's right. like every minute of the day you eat, sleep, drink this because it sounds like a wonderful job that to work with young people, to be outdoors in the summertime, to be planning in the wintertime, to be da 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 da. And so you said camp programs, college conferences, and what else do you do? 
So, I mean, the youth program that I mentioned um, has not only the summer day camp component, but also um, activities throughout the year. So, uh, you know, interacting with our county volunteers and individual youth who want to volunteer directly with the organization to earn some um, uh, recognition uh, through our youth program. So some of those uh, recognitions might include, you know, a scholarship to come to camp for free, an opportunity to go on a co-op sort of uh, field trip to the Twin Cities of Minneapolis. St. Paul every other summer, a chance to go to our national camp, the Farmers Union All States Leadership Camp that National Farmers Union runs. So I'm working Kathy, with our want, adult volunteers and youth throughout the year as well. I want to come back to this when we come off our second break. I'm really enjoying this conversation. Thank you so very much. Okay, everybody, this is Vernon Oaks. The program is Everything Cooperative. And today I'm having the absolute pleasure of talking to Kathy Stats who's the Educational Director of the Farmers Educational and Cooperative Union of America, for short is Wisconsin Farmers Union. And Kathy was telling us all about the lessons that are learned, and they're broken down into three categories. Land, water, and food is one, and global and personal, personal is two, and this cooperative space is a third one. In the cooperative space, they talk about the structure of co-ops, the type and sectors, and then the international space, co-op in the international space. Kathy, I got that you love what you do, and I got why. This is both brain work and physical work, and you work with young people, and it can be a lot of fun. You were talking about that before we took break. Uh, can you keep telling us what you do? Sure. So throughout the year, in addition to you know the planning that happens for the camp program, which begins basically as soon as the previous summer ends, um, I'm interacting with uh, youth and adult volunteers through our youth program. I'm helping with some of uh, aspects of our state convention. I do a co-op career day for high school students in uh, the southeastern part of the state in collaboration with the Vernon County uh, Cooperative Association. I serve on a couple of boards as well, the Association of Cooperative Educators and the Ralph K. Morris Foundation, which provides scholarships to young people who are interested in um, opportunities to learn more about cooperatives and uh, agriculture, especially conservation. So there are um, a lot of great ways to outreach with um, both folks in the agriculture and cooperative community, but the general public as well. Uh, you know, I'm a member of Rotary, and it's been a great gift for me to help educate um, folks in the business community in uh, in my town about um, what co-ops are and the fact that there are co-ops and credit unions all around them that they didn't necessarily know were united by this common business model. Okay, so what town are you in? You said you're in the Rotary of your town. Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Okay. <laughs> All right. I've been a member of Rotary uh, only a couple of years, uh, and I really Welcome. like it also. I uh, like it a lot. And I saw you were the president of your Rotary Club? That's right. Currently uh, co-president. It's my second time around with a small club. Everybody takes a turn. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't want to diminish that presidency or co-presidency by everybody take a turn. I heard that, but uh, <laughs> I remember when women were not even allowed to be in a rotary. So congratulations for being <laughs> in and being active and being leadership, bringing leadership to that. Yeah, world. thank you. Well, that's one of the things that was kind of interesting, you know, when I joined because, uh, I, you know, I come from an organization, as I mentioned earlier, where women have had, you know, full voting rights from the earliest days. In fact, in 1905, uh, the chapter president of one of the locals in Kansas was a woman. 1905. I just think that's a tremendous testament to the kind of organization the Farmers Union is and the ways in which we've been, you know, looking at, um, you know, youth engagement, uh, women's engagement from the very beginning. That is that is wonderful. I got you. Love what you do. <laughs> OK. And I hear your enthusiasm. It comes through the microphone. I'm assuming everybody else out there hear it. And, it, and when you look, when you talk about the program and what's what people are learning, it's like why couldn't everybody get this kind of camp? <laughs> well, I would have loved to have it <laughs> as, as a young person. I did go to a camp at uh, Camp um, Brocious in Wisconsin. Go up to hmm. yeah. I'm going to tell you where it is in a, in a minute here. Okay. So we've got what you're doing. We got this sort of sense of the kinds of things that you are, are teaching. What is a college conference though? What is that? 
Oh, so the College Conference on Cooperatives is a really a great opportunity for students to come from all over the country for a kind of a co-ops 101 weekend in Minneapolis, St. Paul, which is really just such a great uh, center for cooperative activity. Uh, so this program actually got uh, its start in a way through uh, William Nelson, the former president of the CHS Foundation and a former board member of NCBA Clusa. You know, he was an ag teacher wanting to introduce his students to the cooperative business model. And by collaborating with the Minnesota Farmers Union, was able to uh, bring a busload of kids up to tour co-ops in the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, St. Paul. And years later, that um, evolved into what is now a three-day weekend. Great support from the CHS Foundation, CoBank, Farmers Union, and the whole cooperative community of the Upper Midwest, really, to bring anywhere from 80 to 100 college students, mostly from ag backgrounds, so not all, to learn a little bit more about the co-op business model, to get a chance to get out in the city and visit some of those co-ops, and then to think about sort of where that might lead for them. So are they interested in a ag co-op career? Does the idea of international co-op development speak to them? Um, are they you know, interested in maybe being a board member someday or starting their own co-op? While we don't get into the nuts and bolts of co-op development so much, it really provides a nice introduction to um, cooperatives across the spectrum. And I think that's important with the majority of the attendees coming from rural spaces. They may have a fairly narrow notion of what it is to be a co-op, right? They might know the, uh, you know, the ag co-op, maybe the rural electric, but they've probably never visited a senior housing co-op or been in a natural foods co-op or recognized that credit unions are a financial co-op or had a chance to be inside a flagship location for REI, Recreational Equipment Incorporated, the country's largest consumer co-op, which has a very nice retail location in Bloomington. So we take them and out to the co And now in D.C. Co-op. too. They have a flagship yes, in D.C. that's now right. That's right. Their newest flagship store. Yeah. So that's really um, quite eye-opening for these students to recognize that this model is applicable in so many different parts of um, the economy. And one of the things that I hope they take away is a recognition that, number one, co-ops are a great way for you to do business as a farmer. It's a great way to build leadership if you serve on a board. It could be a fantastic career. It might also fill a gap in your rural community now or in the future, right? If the mom and pop grocery store goes out of business, did you know that the community could, you know, buy it and run it as a co-op? If you're looking for some way to solve, you know, some other rural concern, there might be a cooperative solution. So while they're seeing these co-ops in a fairly large and urban context, we really want to make sure that they understand that the model is flexible and can be applied in a lot of different ways. And some of the strongest examples today, you know, grew out of just a few farmers sitting around the kitchen table figuring out how to solve a problem. Figuring out how to solve a problem. Matter of fact, the first month we were on the air, a guy from Senegal Papa Sin said that co-ops are formed to solve community problems. And he further said, if there's no community problem, then there's no need for a co-op. Okay. Uh, (laughs) So, of course, I remember that when that was like, bang. But for those out there that don't know what Kathy has been talking about in these different sectors, let me give you a quick definition here. Uh, So co-ops depends on who owns and controls the business of what type of business it is, what type of co-op it is. If the co-op is owned and controlled by the people that work in that business, that the employees, it's called a worker co-op. Therefore, any type of business you can think of could be owned and controlled by the workers. If it's owned and controlled by the people that uses the products or services, then it's called a consumer co-op. And Kathy just mentioned that in consumer co-ops and ones that we may not know are co-ops is credit unions is owned and controlled by the people that make the deposits and write the checks, housing co-ops. In Madison, there is a um, health clinic that's owned by the patients. It's a patient-centric uh, co-op. Then if it's the farmers have been using this, and that's why farmers know more and, and the Department of Ag know more about co-ops than anybody else in the federal government, but the uh, farmers would create a business to help them to buy what they needed, a purchasing co-op. Uh, so f- a bunch of farmers would get together. They would form this business, and the people in that business would become experts in buying seed or fertilizer or gasoline or diesel or equipment or whatever these farmers needed. So they had a a group of people working for them and they got a more quality, better price normally for their, what they needed to 
produce whatever they're going to produce. So the farmer then produced whatever they're going to produce, and they say, wow, why don't we start a far, a co-op on the other end? And they call a marketing co-op. So it, they would send their the dairy farmer, Kathy and her farmer, Parents could have maybe sent their milk to Cabot Creamery or Organic Valley or some other co-op that would market their, their, their milk or they may, with sometimes called a producer co-op, they may add value to it and make cottage cheese or cheese or yogurt or something. And then they would sell it to markets that in Wisconsin, they may sell it to Florida. I mean, Florida or California, where their their little farm could not reach these markets. So those are the four basics. And these marketing co-ops, uh, artists are beginning to use them. There's a co-op in Pittsburgh, Kathy, that a group of black women artists pulled, pulled themselves together and they make uh, jewelry and uh, wood carvings and paintings and clothing and they have a storefront where each individual artist couldn't do that storefront but by working together they have a storefront and they sell their goods through that so this this co-op works in all kinds of different ways in all kinds of different industries and matter of fact all of them i think so that's just a quick background of what i've learned in these six years of the different types of sectors okay wonderful that nail it yeah that's a great some summary okay yeah, uh, working together here. Okay, you'd be good at this radio program. You should start your own up there in Wisconsin too. <laughs> you'd be really good at this. Okay, so you have a career day. So talk to me about what that career day is all about. And you've and you mentioned careers in farming, but as I just mentioned, you have careers in every industry and in every type in urban and rural areas, and this co-op is for all areas. Okay. Right, right. Absolutely. So the co-op career day that we coordinate with the Vernon County Cooperative Association, which by the way, Vernon County in southwestern Wisconsin is just such a a really rich area for cooperatives, is a chance for all of the cooperative uh, and credit union representatives in in that local area to come together and share with high school students about their co-ops, you know, and about the career opportunities they're in. So this is just a one-day program, but it's a great way for um, the young people in the community to see, typically it's high school, you know, sophomores and juniors who are looking at their next steps. And it's a chance for them to learn about some of the great career opportunities in the local cooperatives, but also a chance to learn about the cooperatives themselves and to see the ways in which they're connected and to teach them a little bit about this cooperative business model. And once again, they're frequently surprised to learn um, about the, the similarities between these, you know, very different sectors in some cases. But to see that there is this common ground of, you know, people coming together, everyday working people coming together to get some product or service that they or access to market that they couldn't do otherwise mm-hmm. alone. And um, that's really exciting for them, I think, to see, again, that there are great jobs in their own community. Um, there are also great opportunities and cooperatives, you know, at a national level. So, you know, sort of the sky's the limit in, as far as where they can go and how they can move, you know, between co-ops as well across sector, uh, which is something I think we don't think about very often. But there are a number of folks who maybe start in sort of one area of co-ops but move to another, um, you know, changing their, um, you know, uh, uh, industry area, but keeping that cooperative piece consistent. And I, I think that's a really interesting thing that cooperatives allow. It, that is very, very interesting. And I've seen, I've seen people do that. I've, out in this program, I met people who have done this. We're going to take our final break here, but I, I checked on our webpage. It's um, www.everything.coop is our webpage. And I went down and I put in CHS. You mentioned William Nelson, and he was on the program, I think, in 2015. In 2015, he mm-hmm. became a member of the Hall of Fame, the Cooperative Hall of Fame. And so I that when you were telling the story a bit, I said, yeah, I, I remember that. So I just went online, and uh, and he was on the program, and I've gotten a chance to meet and talk to him a couple times. He's a great human being. Okay, so we're going to take our next break, and I would like for you to think about, Kathy, particularly when we get to the last minute or two, what you want to leave people with, what kinds of messages would you want to leave people with to know about co-ops and maybe uh, how they can get involved or start one or whatever, whatever you want to say, but we'll, we'll take our next break and we'll be right back. In the 
program is Everything Cooperative, and my name is Vernon Oaks, your host, who has a great pleasure of call, talking to Kathy Stats, who's the educational director of the Wisconsin Farmers Union Cooperative, who loves what she does, and she's been involved with this since she was pre-kindergarten or kindergarten uh, into this program, and their camp programs and youth programs, college conferences, career days, they're doing it up there in that part of the world up in Wisconsin. Okay, Kathy, I I know you said that women uh, had full voting rights uh, ever since the beginning in this uh, cooperative movement, in particular with the farmers, and they have it that when you become, I think you said 16 to 21 years old, if you're in a family farm, you get a chance to vote, so young and so forth. But Kathy, I'm, I'm African American, and I found out that co-ops have also Near the the politics and, if you will, racism of America, and so I'm wondering in this in this um, farm union, did you have African Americans? Because I've talked to the Federation of Southern Co-ops. Cornelius Blanding is now the executive director of that, and and they particular black farmers have formed this co-op in 13 southern states. But did you see this mixture of blacks and whites in this farming, or did that r- racism or separa- separation play out in the farmers' union? That's a great question. Um, and one of the things I discovered when I was researching our summer camp program was that, um, give me just a moment to kind of give you a little background here. Okay. Each summer camp runs a camp co-op store at which the kids can uh, elect a board, they buy a share, they become a member, they earn a dividend, at least in Wisconsin we do, that where the kids actually earn a dividend, and at the end of the camp, any remaining profit gets donated to an external charity or invested back into the camp. So need to get, provide that little bit of context for you. Well, I wanted to get that because you mentioned co-op oh, okay. store before, and so yeah, I'm glad you went sure. back there. Okay, got it. Yeah, so just to just to kind of just that's the sort of the briefest uh, up, up, uh, <laughs> update on that. But that that is by way of um, sharing with you that I discovered when I was uh, looking at some archives with another farmers union um, sort of informal historian, Tom Giesel, in Kansas. He he had come across a newsletter that in 1940, 1940. The union, in 1940, the National Farmers Union Summer Camp, the All States Camp was voting on where to donate this these remaining funds, this extra surplus left over after the kids had finished out, you know, their camp's co-op store for the week. And those campers, who now rem- remember are mostly upper Midwestern, you know, small town farm kids from mostly Montana, North and South Dakota, Wisconsin, Minnesota, voted for their camp co-op surplus funds to go to the Legal Defense Fund of Clinton Clark a black organizer of the Louisiana Farmers Union who had been imprisoned on false charges. So, yes, in the early days, the Farmers Union was very active in the southeastern part of the U.S., very inclusive, as I understand. Did not eventually maintain its success because there was so much pushback to that openness and that inclusion. So... um, that's my understanding of that history, is that uh, definitely the Farmers Unions were organizing in those areas. In fact, there was a, a Farmers Union uh, funeral home in Alabama, <laughs> um, and uh, that uh, they were initially very successful, very robust, and then over time had difficulty sustaining because the organization was explicitly inclusive, and that wasn't very popular. Explicitly inclusive, so that's sort of what I know. who was included and who was not included, explicitly inclusive. That it, that that it was that we because we were inclusive, um, it was difficult to maintain the organization and sort of politically and culturally in that space. I got it. Okay. So, but who was this Clark person that they wanted to donate the money for his legal defense fund? What was yeah, that Clinton Clark, um, as I understand, was the organizer, uh, one of the organizers for the Louisiana Farmers Union. And um, there's a book about him called "Remember My Sacrifice." In July of 1940, he was arrested at a parish-wide rally. He was trying to get over 800 black farmers and workers together and uh, eventually, you know, worked with the larger Louisiana uh, Farmers Union movement to get the Louisiana Farmers Union uh, going. So uh, I, I don't know all the details of his story, but um, I, I, there's, a, there's a connection there historically, a recognition of our solidarity with all farmers 
um, in those days. And uh, I just thought that was kind of a powerful story that, you know, a bunch of kind of upper Midwestern farm kids were um, had, had learned about it, first of all, from someone within the Farmers Union organization and then took the step because this is something that they vote on at the end of every camp, you know, that they voted that these funds, which could have gone to anything, you know, were to go to the Legal Defense Fund of this falsely imprisoned um, black Farmers Union organizer in Louisiana. Wow, that is that in 1940. So that's pre-war. 1940. War okay, right. that's in the height of Jim Crow and all of that stuff. Okay, so in in this in these 13 states uh, that the Federation of Southern Co-ops, uh, I don't know if there's 900 or 9,000 farmers are that belong to this, and they they talk about. Um, how much land uh, black farmers had in 1900 and how much they have today. And it's some huge, I don't know, 30 million acres of land back then and only 3 million acres of land now. Some huge sort of disparity of numbers and how uh, black farmers lost their land. And, and sometimes it was in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, black farmers leaving their land in the South and going North to get work. Um, mm-hmm. So um, there is a, this rich history. Now, have you read Dr. Jessica gordon Nimhard's book, Collective Carriage? I have it, and I know pieces of it, but I haven't read the whole thing yet. Well, so I, I haven't, haven't either. It's a bunch. <laughs> okay. <But laughs> I, I like I like what I've read. I assume because yeah. you're, you're a member of ACE that you may know her through that organization. I do, yes. And um, she's been on the show three or four times and just a phenomenal human being with a great history. And she told me that... Um, or she told the audience that uh, when she started this book, which would be now about 20 years ago, uh, that she was told that blacks were not into co-ops. And <laughs> she kept doing research, and it was 15 years before she produced a book, and she just had found a phenomenal amount of research where blacks were involved in farming. And I want to look, go back and look. I'm going to try to make a, a note to go look up uh Clinton Clark to see if she's written. I kind of think she would have captured him in the book. I don't remember it. So, yeah, she's just a great human being with a great history in, in blacks and co-ops. All of the the main historical figures in, in the history, I don't know about all, but all that I know are in that book because they were for cooperation, whether it's W.E.B. Du Bois or Frederick Douglass or I, I just loads and loads and loads of people mm-hmm. for, for co ops mm-hmm. in this in, in our black experience. Such when an I, untold story. It's very powerful. It is powerful. And uh, Jesse Jackson, he helped to start the Federation of Southern Co ops. Um it's so yeah, it's just a tremendous history, but it's just mm-hmm. not known. And even in the co op mm-hmm. experience, people don't talk about co ops. Do you have any idea right. why that is? I mean, they don't get out there and put this banner because it's just such great work. Yeah, I, I know it's a great mystery, you know, because um, it's really such a powerful story, um, you know, to tell the overall cooperative story. You know, and I remember I was looking at the, in preparation for this call, I was looking at um, James Peter War uh, Bass's Cooperative Democracy book. Um, and he wrote, um, and this is 1936, you know, uh, you know, why haven't cooperatives become, you know, sort of known and, and celebrated by all? And he said, you know, really, lack of information concerning cooperation is the first of a twofold answer. Um, and then the fact that its principles are opposed to privilege is the second answer. He said, cooperation has working against it, ignorance and selfishness. Principles and, you know, opposed what a, to privilege. Mm-hmm. Mm. The principles are opposed to privilege, you know, that that notion of, of equity, um, equality and equity, you know, equality of voice and equity of, of, uh, of um, benefit. Uh, that notion that you know one member one vote, but that your reward or your your share of the profit or surplus is dependent on your engagement with the co-op, you know that equity equity side, mm-hmm. you know that that for some reason those are um, those are really hard for folks who have been raised in kind of a traditional economic structure to understand, and um, so we have those things kind of working against us. Um, and that's why the education piece is so important and so important to start young. And there's a, a long, a long ago slogan within Farmers Union uh, that said education is is health insurance for cooperatives. Wow. 
Okay. You know, and that if health, yeah, that idea that um, you can't just uh, kind of count on folks, you know, hearing about it and deciding it's a good idea. You actually have to intentionally teach about it and um, and start as young as possible, which is why our camp program does that and our youth program does that. Everything else gets marketed, you know, to kids practically in the womb nowadays. And so <laughs> we really need to not sort of uh, set aside cooperatives as some kind of thing to understand when you're, you know, studying for of business or studying economic structures. It's like, no, it's a way of engaging with people and the economy in a uh, in a way that's, you know, that's just, that is um, inclusive, that builds leadership. Um, it builds individual, individual leadership as well as collective leadership. Uh, and you really have to start that as early as possible because the associational or philosophical side of it, you know, um, doesn't come naturally if folks are taught that Business is just about extracting profit, you know, and agreed, increasing shareholder value. Agreed, 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 agreed. Okay, so you know, you just uh, you don't know this, but you've just helped me, and you've gotten me out of the Roberta McDonald's doghouse. Roberta McDonald is the vice president of marketing, and when she was on the program, I told her I think the reason it is is because the one percenters don't want people to know about it. They 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 just and they and they and they go about trying to figure out ways of making sure that people don't know about it. And she said I was sinister, but I think this principles over privilege, but I also think the people that are privileged do really don't want everyday people to know about it because it's a way that we can really get wealth. We can get people to get wealth and people can learn how to run a business and make informed decisions without an MBA. Yeah, and I got one and I've right. never learned about co ops in that. So, but yeah, you just, thank you. You didn't know you were just helping me a lot. Okay. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Last minute, what do you have for, what would you like to leave people with? Oh, we don't have a minute. Well, I'd just I like to say, finished. sure. The cooperative model is so flexible and so interesting, and I really think the time is now for um, introducing it to the next generation. I do, too. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation. Everybody out there, we'll see you next Thursday. Please live cooperatively. <laughs>